Technically speaking, we can say that oil painting is impossible to learn, but don't worry because I'm going to show you an exercise that you can do that's going to help you improve right where it matters. And the good thing is you'll only need three pigments. All right, when I say that oil painting is technically impossible to learn, you know, I'm exaggerating, but in a way I'm not because oil painting is not a, a single unit that you learn as, as a whole. It's a combination of a number of various sub skills, all very tricky on their own to learn that contribute to the oil painting process. The first we can talk about is understanding the behavior of the paint, how it handles and how it applies, how you can lay it down. The second skill could be brushwork and consistency. And the third one, also very tricky, is color mixing. Plus, there are some external factors. This is not about oil painting per se, but it's also very important. Choosing the right pigments for the right job, the right type of brush, this is also a skill that has to be learned. And this part can be quite technical and tricky, but I have a complete oil painting course that mostly focuses on this side. The link is in the description, as always. A second external factor is drawing and proportions. It's typically not oil painting related, it's more an external factor, but it's super crucial. Next you have elements like composition and so on and so forth. So now let me suggest to you an exercise that's going to lower the difficulty level in most of the sub skills that we have that compose oil painting so that it's easier to tackle each one individually and see what each one does so that you can more self-consciously work on paint behavior, brushwork and consistency or color mixing. And this strategy is to make an oil painting with only three pigments, a super limited palette with titanium white, burnt sienna and ultramarine blue. Let's start with a little overview of what this exercise is all about and then we'll dive into our three main sets of skills and see how you can work on each one. First, let's talk about the materials. You'll need some very simple pigments, titanium white, burnt sienna and ultramarine blue, along with obviously a palette, a palette knife to make your mixtures, some brushes, a canvas or a canvas board and in this case I'm using oil painting paper, which is a paper that's been specially prepared for oil. You'll need some odorless mineral spirits, turpentine for thinning the paint, and linseed oil or any type of mixing medium that you might need. But for this exercise, as much as possible, you want to try to not use any medium and use the paint as it come from the tube. Next, you want to select your reference image. Make a master study, but a very cropped master study. So you go on Google Arts and Culture and you can really zoom in very closely. And then what you want is to make a screen capture. So you take just, let's say just this, and bam. Once you have this, you use an oil transfer or a normal pencil transfer to put the outline on your canvas and start with an outline that's already there. So you don't have to worry about composition, you don't have to worry about proportions, and you don't have to worry about anything. Here in my case for this demonstration, I chose this one, The Captive by John Everett Millet in 1882. I really like this painting. Then you want to start by mixing a very limited range of values from your very limited palette. You want to experiment with different ratios of burnt sienna, ultramarine blue and titanium white to achieve a variety of skin tones and shadows. Remember that burnt sienna and ultramarine blue can create a very rich range of browns and grays. So you want to have fun with it, mess around on the palette, see how it goes, try to see what the limit of the gamut is the gamut being a fancy word for the amount of mixed colors you can make with the three that we started with. And just one note, uh, in this video you might hear me say transparent iron oxide or burnt sienna. In this case it's the same pigment, it's the exact same thing, it's PR 101 in both cases. The same pigment can have different names depending on where you find it and one super important thing as well is that depending on what brand makes the paint that you're going to be using, the color might be very different. So 
I might get a certain mix with the ultramarine that I have and the burnt sienna that I have, but yours might be completely different depending on the opacity. You know, each brand has their own version of how a pigment looks and it might greatly change the outcome of your mixtures. So you really, you can't really trust what I'm doing here with my pigments. It might be completely different. I generally start with the background and here you can see that I have some kind of gray. I can't achieve the type of greenish background that the original has, but what I'm gonna try to do is make something that has approximately the same value and leave it at that. It's just a background, not really important here in this case. And now really what I want to focus on are the skin tones and that's really the point of this exercise. To start with the skin tones, what you want to do is start with the darkest dark. You want to make it with ultramarine blue and burnt sienna with no white. And you'll see that depending on the pigments you have, of course, you can achieve something quite dark, not perfect black, you know, not pitch black, but still pretty usable and definitely a very decent black to use in this situation. Next, you want to work from cutter to cutter and try to compare each stroke to the previous one, focusing mostly on values. Progressively, you want to adjust with warm and cool, simply add burnt sienna if it's too cool and ultramarine blue if it's too warm. The perfect mix of both with extra white should give you some type of gray. So understand how to balance the warm and cool hues. And again, always keeping in mind that we don't have to get a perfect copy of the cutters of the model. So the best is to do the best you can really with warm and cool. You want to simplify, divide the entire painting families of hues into warm and cool and just try to make both of the big families work together. You really want to put an effort into going back to the palette as often as possible to preserve the vitality of your brush strokes. No more than three strokes before going back to the palette for fresh paint. You also really want to pay attention to edges. Soften or sharpen edges where necessary to create a realistic sense of depth and dimension. And this could be achieved by blending cutters or using a dry brush technique. You can even create effects and use chromatic edges. For example, use a touch of pure blue, voluntarily exaggerating the hue to make a more contrasting brush stroke or to create an effect. When you get closer to the end, you want to add the highlights and make the final details. You want to use almost pure titanium white sparingly in the end to create the highlights. Not pure, almost pure white, but slightly polluted with a touch of burnt sienna usually works for the highlights on the skin tones. You want to pay attention to the orientation of the lights and the areas where light hits the face the most directly and features that really require emphasis and more impasto-like brush strokes. Before you finish, you want to step back. Actually, this is something you need to do periodically throughout the process. You want to step back from your painting to assess your progress and make any necessary adjustments. You want to compare your work to the original reference image as often as possible, make it a habit and make sure that you really focus on being accurate in your values, your brush strokes. As you get close to the end, you want to uh, switch to smaller brushes, refine the features of the face, finish the last details, pay attention to the subtle shifts, and then you'll reach the final touches. Once you're satisfied with your painting, make any final adjustments and call it a day. Allow your painting to dry completely if you want to work with several layers. Although this shouldn't be necessary for this exercise, it's better to keep it simple and do it all in one layer in one session. The goal is not to be picture perfect again, but to work on the three main skills that we saw earlier and actually, well, let's talk about them more in details now. Let's really dive in. First, let's talk about the benefits of this kind of study to understand color mixing. It's really going to simplify things and make it way easier for you to get into color mixing with only warm and cool. 
So with only three colors, you are forced to mix a wide range of hues, tints, shades, and tones. And this exercise teaches you how to manipulate color by adjusting the ratios on a very limited palette. I mean, there is not more limited than this. More limited would be only two colors, but it's very tricky to do something good with only two colors here. There is just enough variety, but this is the bare minimum in terms of number of pigments that you can find. But there is already a wide variety of nuances that you can create just out of these. For example, by mixing burnt sienna and ultramarine blue, you can create various shades of brown and gray, which can be further modified with titanium white to achieve lighter value. There's a very wide range of colors that you can create out of this limited selection, but again, the good thing is you can't really get lost. It's so limited that it really keeps you in a very comfortable area where you can just experiment with warm and cool, but you never reach a point where it's just so confusing that you're completely lost. This palette is also very, very interesting because it, it's all about warm and cool, and warm and cool is super important in painting. Burnt Sienna obviously is for the warm tones and ultramarine blue is more for the cool tones, no surprise there. But you'll see that there's different effects that you can achieve if you mix them and blend them or if you juxtapose them. So by blending them you can get a very quiet gray, very neutral, and by putting them side by side you can actually achieve an exciting contrast. Making this kind of study will allow you to see how warm colors advance and cool colors recede, creating this depth, this vibrancy, this dimensionality in your art. So you'll always be on the lookout for this contrast between warm and cool and it will help you to create these nice warm and cool balance effects in your paintings. Next absolutely massive point on color mixing is value control. Limited palettes encourage you to focus on value, so lightness and darkness, rather than relying on a wide array of colors and hues. By manipulating mostly values, the values of the three pigments, you learn to create depth and form in your painting and you understand the most crucial part of color mixing, which is value mixing. It's also a great way to work on simplicity and harmony. Working with a super limited palette forces you to simplify complex scenes with their essential elements and just when you can't achieve a cutter, it will teach you how to work your way around it and use the limitations of your pigments. So rather than give you the habit of always trying to get the perfect paint tube every time for each individual cutter, it will just force you to develop a keen eye for color relationships. So you might not get the perfect blue or the perfect green, but you can make a color that's more blue or more green that looks more like another. And, and it's more about how colors relate to each other and not getting the right color. That's the point here in this exercise. So working with a super limited palette like that is a great exercise and not only for uh, beginner artists, even experienced artists gain a lot from simplifying colors, focusing on values and harmony. It's a great exercise and it's going to help you get a lot better at this, this specific set of skills that's going to make oil painting much better for you. Making an exercise like that is also a great way to understand brushwork and paint consistency. The first thing is it, it's a great kind of tool to understand brushwork variation, how much the color looks different depending on how you apply it. If you just press once or if you rub the canvas repeatedly, the color will feel very different and will look very different. And making an exercise with a very limited selection of pigments is a very great way to understand that very clearly because it can't be anything else. There's just three pigments. So if the color changes as you rub it in on the canvas, it can only be the action of 
your brush pressing repeatedly that's making this happen and this is a great discovery and you really want to understand and discover that with a paintbrush in your hand. Working with a limited palette encourages you to make brushwork your priority because you don't have any complicated set of colors to worry about as you go. So the only thing you have to worry about is just getting the right value and getting the gesture, applying the paint the right way. If the color doesn't look right as you apply it, it's mostly because you're not applying it the right way. So you'll see, making this will allow you to experiment with different brush sizes, shapes, and different types of strokes, different types of angle, pressure to emulate the texture and the style of the original painting, and you'll, you'll learn just so much from just brushwork alone. And pain consistency is also a huge thing. Uh, pain consistency refers to, you know, the thickness or the thinness of the paint. Uh, different techniques may require varying levels of pain consistency from working very thinly uh, as, as the, the painting starts usually looks, feels more like a watercolor. It's almost transparent and you build up the thickness progressively but this is something that you have to, to do with a study like that, that you have to really practice with a study like that, making things in order, working first thinly and then building up the thickness gradually and bringing more paint, more opacity as you go. But making this kind of master study, you'll learn how to adjust paint consistency to achieve specific effects that you might observe in the original artwork. For example, you may need a thin translucent layer of paint for glazing or to the contrary, a thick opaque application for impasto highlights. Working with a limited palette simplifies the process of understanding this kind of paint consistency as you have fewer variables to manage and you can really focus on your brushwork and handling the paint. Working on a master study is also a great way to understand how the artist, the master, has created texture and form with brushwork and using paint consistency. And using paint consistency, whether it's by capturing the softness of the skin, the roughness of the fabric, or the details of the highlights in the hair, Understanding how to manipulate paint to convey a realistic sense of texture is absolutely essential. You know, I'm really big on texture. I always focus a lot on texture and this kind of limited palette exercise is, is a great way to work on that because it forces you to not worry about the various hues and all the potential of a, a very wide palette. You only have three colors. So the best you can do with that is focus on values and focus on textures. It's really a great exercise to help you refine your brush handling skills, such as varying the pressure, the direction, the speed even of the brush strokes. And as you become more adept at manipulating your brushes and paint consistency, you'll gain more confidence. And this is confidence that you can incorporate in all of your artistic projects later on. And last but not least, a limited palette like that is a great way to understand how the paint behaves. Obviously, the paint doesn't behave like the paint is an inanimate object, but it's still a great way to observe how paint application work by closely studying how the master has painted and trying to replicate its technique. You can gain first-hand experience in observing how the paint is, is applied and how the paint reacts to the grain of the canvas, the pressure, the thickness, how it makes the paint feel differently. Because really this is not something that can be taught. I can try to describe it to you however I want. The thing is you need to learn this with a brush in your hand and trying to put the paint on the canvas. There's no way on earth that I can have enough words 
to describe something so complex. You can spend your entire art career working on pain consistency and still have tons to explore at the very end. So there's no way to, you, you know, analyze and make a systematic description of how to control that. You have to practice. That's just how it is. You have to practice, practice, practice. It's just like, for example, if I'm trying to describe to you how to score a penalty kick at soccer, I can try to describe how the position of your foot should be and how the how to position the weight of your body and all. But if you don't like train, you're never going to score any goal at any point. And this is the same with painting. What you want to do is you want to explore the properties of the paint itself, how the material behaves. Oil paints have unique properties that influence how they behave, how the canvas reacts, such as the, their viscosity, the opacity, the drying time. By working with oil paints in a master study exercise like that, a limited master study, you can explore these properties really in detail. For example, you can learn that thicker, more opaque paint can be built up to create something that's more like an impasto, whereas thinner, more transparent paint can be used for more layering, glazes, washes. Through experimentation with paint consistency and application technique, you'll get a much deeper understanding of how to manipulate oil paints to achieve the effects that you desire. And one important thing is, like I said, for these exercises, I recommend that you use the paint as it comes from the tube. The medium that I recommend is just simply linseed oil, uh, nothing more. Really want to keep things as simple as possible. A medium is not a mandatory thing in a painting, and I want you to explore painting without medium and try to understand the paint as it comes from the tube. This is super important. You don't always have to use a medium, a painting medium. It's not a necessity all the time. And for this kind of exercise, it's great to use raw paint and try to make the most out of it. You'll see that you can actually do a lot. And the final benefit of this kind of exercise is problem solving. Really, um, making a painting is like getting a bunch of problems to solve and trying to solve them almost at the same time. The paint feels too stiff, that's a problem. How do you deal with it? Uh, the paint is too fluid, that's a problem. How do you deal with it? Colors get muddy, that's a problem. How do you deal with it? Uh, it's too dark, how do you deal with it? problem solving. Whether it's about paint consistency, refining in the brushwork, troubleshooting, color mixing issues, you'll learn to assess your work critically and make the right decisions to deal with the difficulties that are going to present themselves. And because the exercise has a, a, a low level of difficulty, because we've simplified the process so much, you'll see that the difficulties can be solved quite easily and usually one by one. And this is this process of experimentation, observation and adjustment that's going to be essential for your artistic growth and development. So we said earlier that oil painting is technically impossible to learn and no, it's not technically. If you deal with problems individually, at a manageable level. If you're trying to solve all the problems at the same time, then you're obviously going to be overwhelmed. But if you can manage to drop the difficulty level of all the problems and try to solve them one by one, then absolutely the whole process is going to be a breathe and it's going to be just so easy to learn. All right, so that's just one exercise. I'm pretty sure it's going to help you improve, but if it doesn't, YouTube suggests that this could be helpful as well. So you can click on that and I'll see you for the next one. As always, my friends, joy and inspiration to you.